Okay, oh, Gaz is with us. Okay. Um, I mean, we... Hi, Gaz. Hi, how are you doing? Um, okay, I'll introduce you. We've got other students coming, but these two generally, these two are like always at the forefront of ways to like get cracking. Um, and yes, they'll probably have a load of questions for you after. I'm just going to forewarn you. So, uh, guys, Jenna, over. This is Gareth Murphy, Cobra Extraordinaire. Hello. Hello, Gary. Hi, guys. And, uh, we'll give it another five minutes, and um, we'll let <coughs> well, Actually, you know what? We're recording the session. Let's just get started. We're recording this in any case. So, Gaz, you want to tell these guys a little bit about yourself? Yep. Can I just check? Is there an echo or anything happening on my uh, mic? I'm not hearing an echo. It sounds pretty good. What about you? Okay, good. Because, uh, yeah. Sometimes people complain about that. Yep, so uh, what, shall I uh, start with the PowerPoint? Uh, no, just to uh, start with a brief introduction of yourself, your amazing journey and the kind of groovy things that you work on. All right. You have, you have a captive audience, man. <laughs> yep, well, I started uh, making games when I was a child on the ZX Spectrum, well, trying, very difficult back in the uh, 80s without the internet and... Uh, there was no real help around, but I kept trying and then moved on to the Amiga computer, which was a main computer in the 90s before the PC dominated, and then tried and failed to learn C++ for many years, and then found other languages that were a bit easier, like Blitz Basic and things like that, and then managed to make some pretty poor games on the Amiga, really awful looking back, but managed to win some awards and that. I won uh, Game of the Month from Amiga Format Magazine, and uh, then I went on, made a commercial Amiga game, then I went to university, swapped fully to PC, and learned Java, so I spent four years, in, it's uh, Stirling University in Scotland, learning Java and uh, making games in my spare time, and then after that I got hired by Rockstar North in Edinburgh, and went on to work on Grand Theft Auto Vice City, which was a kind of dream job for someone who's, uh, you know, always wanted to get into the industry. And then I left that because I wanted to form my own games company, so I uh, resigned and uh, went on to do a master's degree in technology and innovation management because um, I thought that would help me be able to run my own games company. Uh, that didn't really work as well as I thought, so I went freelance as a games developer, and then I started working for DC Studios in Glasgow, working on mobile games, where uh, I was the lead programmer on Ice Age Skater, the mobile game for Ice Age, and some other ones, and uh, eventually I became a game designer there, as well as a uh, lead programmer, so I made my own game called Super Wow Ball, and um, that was on the verge of getting released, even went to E3, the big game shows and things like that. But then, unfortunately, that company went bankrupt uh, because we didn't get paid for a big Star Wars game we made. And then um, they closed down. So then I uh, went fully freelance on my own, carried on making my own games and went to um, just carried on freelance. And then I moved out to be with my girlfriend who was in Taiwan. So I've been freelancing from Taiwan and going back to the UK um, for the last sort of 15 years. But uh, then I was making my own games in Java then and making game design tools as well in Java to help you drag and drop games. And then I discovered Unity one day and I just dropped all my own tools, even though I'd been writing them for over eight years, almost every day. And then, because as soon as I saw Unity, I realized it was just so much better and so much easier and um, just a lot more robust and fully 3D and the thousands of people working on it. So um, I've been freelancing in Unity, making Android apps as well, using Android Java and iOS using Flutter. And that sort of brings me to the day, which is I've got a game that I've been making for nearly 10 years and I've got some screenshots of it in my uh, PowerPoint so you'll be able to see yeah, it was all there uh, I'll just move I'll put the chat on it was all there uh, unity I haven't uh, used uh, unreal well I've looked at it but unity I stuck with because C sharp is 
a nice language and I still to this day don't really like C++ which is what you need to use for Unreal so C Sharp makes it a little bit easier I think so yeah the game I'm making now is going to go to the Tokyo Game Show in about a week and uh, maybe I'll be able to win something who knows but yeah, that's pretty much my history up to now. I'm, I've always been addicted to making computer games. Um, and Unity can do mobile and desktop, PS5, Xbox, Series X, any platform you can mention, even the Nintendo ones. Um, so it's, a, it's an amazing tool, actually, for game development. And that's what I want to show here as a quick introduction to it. It's not really simple, this introduction. And I don't know if people will be following along using uh, Unity as well. If so, you should probably load it up now. If not, I'll do it and you can watch it and you can always watch this back later and I'll give the PowerPoint and project files and that to JB so you can um, grab them and go through it in your own time. No problem, I'll get all of that uploaded to Ola, including the recording of this presentation as well and the slides from your deck too. Nice one. Right, I'll need to work out how to share screens, I guess. Uh, yeah, just. Right, hopefully it shares the. Oh, yeah, you get a choice of screens. I've got five or six screens. I've got six screens here at the moment. Um, you do need a lot of screen space for. Uh, Unity and game dev. Uh, is that sharing? You should be able to see it now. Okay, good. So, so yeah, why Unity? Well, it's very powerful 3D game engine, like I mentioned, and it's uh, it's a lot easier than trying to do this stuff from scratch. So, it's it's a lot simpler than trying to write, even just trying to make a cube work in 3D on your own using OpenGL could take weeks, months, even years to get a 3D cube spinning, which you can do in Unity in, you know, literally 10 seconds if you know what you're doing. Porting is made very easy, like I say, converting to various platforms is exceedingly easy. Like, literally, you can tick a box and say, I want a Nintendo port, and that will work on the Nintendo consoles. Of course, you still have to worry about the optimization and things like that, and make sure that um, it's not too slow on the Wii and things, so it, although it will port it for you, it won't do all the optimization, so you've got to be careful with that. Um, yeah, you can focus on the fun bits, like I said, so you don't have to write loads of code just to make a 3D object appear. It does all that for you. It uses C Sharp, which is a very nice language, especially if you know a bit of Java or JavaScript. Um, you'll find that it's very nice and simple. And it does all the memory management and things like that for you, where C++ doesn't. So you don't have to delete objects and things like that, because as soon as uh, the garbage collector kicks in in the C-sharp runtime, it'll clean up the mess, unlike C++, where you have to do that manually. Um, you can make awesome game development tools, too. Like Most of my game is powered by my own AI, um, and I have like drag-and-drop tools that allow me to... Uh, put NPCs in. I can make hundreds of people in one day now because I have my tool which can actually uh, save out a character and all the details as a JSON file like XML or text or something, just that kind of file. And I can literally import all the information back from that file into onto any character that I have bought from the asset store or made and it will just start working as an NPC. So the tools that you can make are really powerful um, and there's lots of jobs out there for not just the tools but also the games you can work on a lot of high profile mobile games like uh, Call of Duty Mobile and things like that and uh, even like Assassin's Creed and things like that um, wait what was that last point uh, yeah the games you make will be beyond your wildest dreams so it, it gives you 10 to 100 times more ability than you really have uh, once you start using Unity and people look at the games and think you're some sort of genius but really Unity is doing a lot of the heavy lifting for you um, just I've put some screenshots of my game in here just so you can see the sort of thing that you can make 
You can see I've got a radar in the corner. I've got this guy working behind the counter serving food. And people can actually go over there, sit down, order food, and he can walk about and you can talk to him and stuff. And you can click on that menu at the top to actually pick what you want to eat. It's a bit like Yakuza if anyone's played that. And just another screenshot of one of my um, cities to show what sort of wild stuff you can do and the, the beautiful kind of glow and the way the light works in Unity these days is really fantastic. Um, so I've, I've said a lot of this, 10 years, almost every day, I push myself to work as hard as I can on it when I'm not working for other people. And you can, you know, I've made two and 3D games, AR games, VR experiences. Did one for the Indian military actually, a, a helicopter simulation. Written over 500,000 lines of code in Unity in the last 10 years. Um, and made like an open world game. And before that, it was, like I said, Amiga, GTA, mobile games. I made pit, I did ports of Peterboy, Buster Move, Double Dragon. Maybe you haven't heard of them because they're quite old, but from my era they're actually very famous games. So we're going to make something like this, hopefully, in the next two hours. Um, now, it basically, it's, it's footballs that drop down and use physics and bounce off these things and then spill off the edge, which I'm going to demonstrate in a second. Um, demo all right I'll show the demo now um, so if I go to unity here I'm not used to it on one screen and normally I've got it spread across but it'll work just the same so um, let's see interesting ah you see I commented out the code because <laughs> one of the uh, one of the things is to ask people to do the solution so I'll just put that back uh, okay. so this is writer by the way this is a good uh, ID I do mention it in the in the uh, Presentation. So, Unity is recompiling that file right now. Um, so we'll try again. Well, this is good, isn't it? Compiler RS. This should uh, not should be easy to fix. But you can see basically when you get a compiler error. Uh, struggling with space here. Unity will bring it up here and you see the red in the top and it will tell you what's actually wrong so you can see actually it's missing a bracket there because update isn't finished so every time you make a change in, in the tool which will be Visual Studio if you're using the default one then Unity you come back in and it has to recompile it for you it'll be quicker than this because this is actually built into my main game at the moment so that's why things seem a bit slower right here we go so if I press the button there left mouse button right now a ball will drop and this is what we will build and then later we'll convert it or in your spare time you'll convert it so that the balls keep dropping automatically but if I keep tapping the left mouse button here you can see all the physics in that works and it's quite uh, exciting in a way uh, why am I struggling to get to the scene view never seen that happen before um, so what you'll see here is it really is just a few 3D objects um, so let's have a look uh, Right, so I wanted to start again from uh, scratch with that demo so you can see how it was built. So we'll go File, New Scene. I'll pick Basic, Built In for now. The other ones are HDRP, which is awesome if you want to make really high quality graphics, but for now we're not too concerned with that. So 
the basic shortcut keys uh, are QWERTY along the top of the keyboard. Um, so if I just make a couple of things here to demonstrate. If you want to make something simple like just a cube, you can go to Create Object 3D Cube where you can make spheres and things like that. So if I want to focus on this uh, cube, I can press F and it will zoom in. Actually, I don't know if I put F in there, did I? Oh, I did. Um, so Q will bring up this hand, right, which is not that useful, to be honest. It just allows you to look around. I, I never use that one. W gives you this one, which allows you to move it in space, 3D space. And you can see at the top right there, the position is on X is changing, and this one changes Z, and this one changes, oops, this one changes Y. So you can move any object in 3D space, um, which sounds simple, but that's actually quite powerful. When I started with X and A on the Xbox years ago, you couldn't even you couldn't even do that. Um, you had to do it all in code. So, um, oh Jesus, wait a sec, I'll just close the line. I was trying to work out how to set it to busy, but I couldn't I couldn't work it out. Uh, so the next key is E. E lets you rotate. So you can spin it. Oops, what's that in the corner? Uh, how do I get rid of that? Let's have a look. Okay. If you see the rotation on Y there, you can see it moving around as I drag, and I can rotate it this way to change the other rotations. Um, and if you hover over it you can see that the line gets a little bit bolder so let's say I, if I go right click and reset this back to zero so you can see uh, if I hold when it's bold like that if I hold control it moves in 15 degree increments so you can flip things um, perfectly with that rather than guessing or going I wanted 90 and then having to spend ages doing this of course you can edit up here too, but yeah, the alt, I mean that's control actually, not alt. What does alt do? Let's oh, see, I've got that wrong. Uh, Alright, okay, you can get around the scene with alt and the mouse, right? So if I hold alt now and I press the left mouse button, that just allows me to look about. And the mouse wheel will zoom in and out and I can look about. Um, so you've, then you've got R, which uh, allows you to resize it. You can drag that middle one to take the whole, make the whole thing grow. And you can see the scale in the top right moving. Or you can stretch it with just the red one that way, green one that way, and the blue one that way. So you can actually make rooms just by making cubes and resizing them. And actually, most of my game is really just cubes. T. Uh, T is this new system which allows you to, it's a bit like resizing but it's a bit easier to do. You can just drag like that. So it's basically a, a simpler uh, resize tool. Why? I'm not actually sure what that does. It seems to open up a few different ones at the same time. I only discovered that when I thought if they're using QWERTY, why aren't they using Y? And then I realized they are. Um, F to zoom in. Well, V is a bit of a complex one, but I'll just briefly explain it. Let's say you had lots of cubes, and you wanted them to fit neatly together. You, instead of trying to drag this one and, and go, is it is it close? Is it perfect? Is it overlapping? You could actually uh, hold down, you, you hover over it like this, you hold down V, and you click it once, and you can drag it, and it'll lock to other, like, angles and corners so you can zoom in with F there so if I go down the corner here and I want and I hold V and use the left mouse button it'll click and lock perfectly to that one so you can't even tell they're two objects that's how perfect it locked so the, the V trick is exceedingly useful although it took me a while to get used to um, yeah they used to have WASD that you could actually move around your scene a bit like a FPS, but they seem to have removed that. Um, and you can do it with the cursors a little bit. Even holding shift makes you go quicker. So it's a bit like an FPS, just a quick way of looking around. 
Um, okay, so that was the, you know, the basic controls. What we want to do now is build that thing I was just uh, showing. Oh, that was the demo that I've showed you, right? So, you make a new scene, file new scene, which I'm going to do this now. I have to keep flicking back because I want you to keep them on both screens. So we'll start again. Right, you need light, so actually Unity provides you a light, which you can see here in the hierarchy window. Um, there's a directional light there and there's a main camera already so if you go to your main camera and you click gizmos here this shows you what is in your scene uh, that should show the camera frustrum yep for some reason that's not oh you have to open camera like that in the inspector before it will show but what this triangle here represents what the camera will see and in the bottom you can see the actual preview of the camera so it's it's seeing nothing right now just a horizon because there isn't anything to show and you can adjust the a lot of stuff about lighting here it's actually changed in tw 2021 but you can change <coughs> the intensity here <coughs> and it does tend to make them too bright so you can lower that Right, we've got the camera. So we, what we want is the three cubes, um, or the four cubes, or whatever it was that I showed with the footballs bouncing. So first of all, we should start by making um, a cube for the floor, right? So you, you go game object, 3D object, cube, and you'll see that it appears in the hierarchy here. Um, get that a little bit wider and you can click that and change it to let's just call it floor and that has a box collider as you can see here on the right which means that anything that hits it will collide with it so press F to zoom in and then you can use T to just make it a bit bigger right so it's a big floor like that and now notice there's no texture right so it looks a bit awkward um, so you can download a texture and apply it, right? So you know, I just literally just googled uh, wall texture and uh, go to Google Images, and you'll get some wall stuff. Uh, I think I used this one. I've already got them, but you know, any of these can be brought into Unity. I think it's that one. You got to worry about the legalities in the future and license them and things, but for now you don't really have to, right? So, if I I've already downloaded it and put it in my project, which you do by uh, putting them in. This is the source of your project, right? So, assets, anything you put inside assets here, if it's a if it's a text file or or anything you put in at all will be interpreted by Unity. So I can actually type in here. I, I call them Ravens Born something. So if I type Raven in there, and you can sort through only audio clips, animation clips, fonts, and things. So it's, this is a texture. So if I tick texture there, then it'll only show textures with the word Raven in them. So you can see my bricks there. So if you just drag that and drop it, Unity will generate a material automatically for you and apply it. So material is kind of, you can see here uh, on the mesh renderer, everything is that is a 3D object is a mesh and it needs a renderer. And the material is bricks Ravensbourne. So a material is kind of like a, like a holder for your um, textures. And you can adjust things about the material. I can make it more metallic, for example. You can make it smoother. So you can see the way the light changes on it, because just because it's smoother. Um, you can make it actually emit light at different intensities, and it'll actually affect the things around it because of the way the light bounces and things. Um, so what we're going to do here is 
we'll make the f we'll make the floor. We'll just make it a bit wider. And you can see how they look awkward when they're stretched. So you either have to keep them um, not stretched, or you can adjust the tile mapping in here, right? So you can actually tell it how much you want it to be stretched or not. And if you see that seam there, like three bricks from the right, you can actually change the offset to try and hide that. If I adjust the Y offset, you can make that seam kind of end there. So there's our floor. Now you can see the camera's not quite looking at the f at the right bit. It's because it's looking at the it's looking from far away. So I can actually move uh, the floor a bit and bit more in front of the camera. And if you want, you can look at the game view at the same time like this. You can on the left, you can preview what it might see, and you can set different screen sizes here. I'll just put 16 by 9 so then you can work interactively like that and you can go okay that looks quite good rotate that that looks like a good floor bring it a bit closer maybe and now uh, obviously the game view scales as you uh, increase the size of the window so we'll make that a bit bigger and now what we want to do is we'll put a back on it just so the balls don't fall off the back so another good trick is you can control D here you see how it makes floor with a 1 after it in the hierarchy here and then you can just rotate that using um, what was it? E. I'm so used to doing it I keep forgetting E and then you can rotate that like that and pull it back a little bit so it forms a kind of wall that looks good. <clears throat> and now, remember, we're working towards this idea, so I need these two cubes here as well for the football to bounce off. Um, so, again, you can actually duplicate. Well, we'll change the name of that to back wall. Duplicate that. And now we have another one which we can move around. So, I can pull that out like that um, and I can rotate it like that move it up a bit now it's too wide obviously so I can zoom out and pull it in like that this is all using the shortcut keys I explained earlier which you should make sure that are ingrained in your mind really quickly to make life easy now I can rotate that to about say 45 degrees and then duplicate it again, control D rotate it using E and hold alt and wait till the lines thick like that and then do that so now we have that like V thing where the footballs will fall in and, and should be able to bounce off each of these and they won't be able to fall out the back because of that wall there but they will be able to fall out the front so we might as well uh, lower that to there um, now the floor, we might as well give it a floor texture, so I downloaded one called Pavement. I'll just put that on there like that. As you can see, it kind of some bricks on the ground. Right. Um, so we've done that. That's just another picture of my game to show you kind of the complexity you can get to um, eventually if you put a lot of time into it. So I showed the mixing, the fixing, the tiling. So what we want to do is add the football, which is basically a sphere with a texture on it. Um, so we'll do that now. And remember to save from time to time. Unity is a buggy beast at times, or it was. It's it's a lot better now if you get 2020. Um, so to make the sphere, the football that we want to drop for the demo. Create object, 3D object, sphere, press F, no, sometimes you have to click on the window like that and then press F to zoom in. As you can see it's absolutely tiny, so we can press R and then drag this middle one only so it scales always. That looks, looks good. Pull it up a bit and position it somewhere like that. And then you can download a texture, put it in your assets, call it football, drag it on. 
So now you've got a semi-convincing football. Seams are a bit awkward there. Like I said, you can adjust that sort of thing with uh, offsets and, and tiling, but we'll not worry about that right now. So then we've got a football. Now if we run this, obviously, well, not obviously, but nothing will happen because there's no physics, right? They're all static objects. So the ball, even though we kind of think maybe it should drop, won't do anything, just, just stays there. You can still move it in the game, which is good. You can actually play with things while the game's running to check how they look. But as soon as you exit the game, everything is reset back to the way it was before. So common mistake is to make a load of changes and think, oh, that looks awesome now. And then you unplay the game and it all goes back to normal. So you have to remember that. And there is an option uh, in, the, in the settings somewhere or an asset which allows you to change the whole screen to like red or something to remind you that you're actually... Um, playing so you don't make that mistake so you can you can google that but I've got used to it now and there are a couple of things that do work perfectly during play mode which is adjusting the textures so if, for example if I make that ball really shiny and metallic you can see it's reflecting the world there um, even if I stop the game it'll actually stay it went back to its original place but the, t the material stayed shiny and nice so that's good Um, right, so we, uh, yeah, we want to add some physics so that it will drop. So we want to to do that. You uh, need to add the rigid body component to the sphere, and then it'll fall, but it won't bounce. So we'll deal with that in a minute. Um, so if you go to, uh, we'll just close this material here. Let me pause Dropbox, which is absolutely draining everything. Trying to back up the game, that's taking uh, six days to back up a copy of my game, which is a 170 gig RAW file. Right, so how to make the ball bounce, add component button here, and you can just type whatever you want in this. So we want rigid body. You you select that and it adds it automatically. Use gravity is already ticked. So when we run this, it should drop. This stupid window here, the bundled resources area, you won't get that. That's something to do with my project. So the ball, you'll see on the right here, it should drop. And you will see it in the game world too. There it is. We obviously made the whole thing very large. That's why the ball appears to be moving so slow. Because it's, it's huge. Probably like size of a city block or something that doesn't really matter so you can see it rolls a bit but it doesn't bounce very easy to do that you can add um, physics material well, how it should be there the option for physics material let's stop maybe you have to do it during uh, when you're not running the game, uh, sphere collider. Ah, okay, sorry. So in the sphere collider itself, it has a material. So you can actually set different ones. I'll click on that, and you can. The, a lot of these are given to you for free. I, I've probably got a lot of these from assets, but they give the ball different properties. You know, you can make it like a basketball. You can make it like a stone, a brick. So we'll just go for something like uh, something that will bounce. So you can see I've got a few here. Pinball, low bounce. Uh, I want something a bit more bouncy than that. I will just make it a, a basketball. So that should hopefully behave like a basketball. Let's see what happens when we run it. Yeah, that didn't really behave like a basketball, did it? We can increase the mass of the ball, which should make it uh, behave slightly differently. Let's see what happens. <laughs> I 
Uh, maybe basketball isn't good enough. AR bouncy, what's that one? And like you can see, I'm doing all this in runtime, right? The game is still running, so I will lose these, but it gives me a way to experiment and work out what actually works. There we go. So now uh, it's crazy bouncy that actually. I wonder if that's related to the mass. So if you wanted to keep these changes here without losing them, <coughs> well, you can only keep one. You can right click and copy component, right? That copies everything you've done. So you can paste it back once the game stops. Um, so I'll just do that for Sphere Collider to demonstrate. So copy component. If I stop the game now, you see rigid body goes back to mass one, and Sphere Collider here goes back to the basketball. But if I right click on it and paste component values, it brings it back to what I had. So it's a very useful trick for things that you've actually done while it's playing and then you want to keep. And there's probably a tool out there that allows you to keep changes, but uh, I, haven't, I haven't got one yet. During playtime, I mean. Right, so that's better, actually. The mass being lower means it doesn't bounce out of the thing. Though it bounces uh, quite a lot with AR bouncy, but that doesn't really matter. I'm assuming if I increase the mass now, it'll actually fall a bit. <laughs> That's a very unrealistic bouncy AR bouncy. Let's pick another one. A bouncy sphere. Yeah, that, that's a bit more realistic. So again, I'll do the trick. Copy component. Stop the game running by hitting play. Paste the values back into sphere collider. So now we have a bouncy ball. And yeah, that could take a long, long, long time to code if you didn't use Unity. I actually made a game, that game I mentioned earlier, Super Wow Wow Ball, which actually re-released as Radiant Silver Sphere. It's out on, I think it's the Amazon App Store. It's, it's a bit old now, I made it in 2003, but I, that game is about a bouncy ball, and I actually coded the physics from scratch myself, and it took me over a year to get the ball bouncing physics that felt and looked correct. So you can see how much better Unity is, right? Giving you this for free. Just run it again just to see quickly what it does. And as a side note, if you want to change the background, you can do that in if you go to uh, window rendering lighting this is actually changed in Unity 2021 when you use HDRP but which is something that you don't need to look at right now but um, in the old days yeah it looks like my Unity is not set up but actually there's, a, there's normally an option there for uh, skybox we can adjust that, but we'll leave it for now. Um, right, we've done the two cubes. You saw it bounce, and that uses PhysX from NVIDIA, which is a very powerful physics engine. Been decades spent on working on that uh, from thousands of people. A lot of work to make that ball bounce, and it's actually accelerated by your NVIDIA graphics card as well, I think, depending on which one you've got. Just another example of, of what you can do with Unity given the uh, ten, given the time and uh, dedication and passion. It needs passion, obviously, all of this. It's like learning Chinese or something. You can't just do it unless you're, you're dedicated to really trying. But you can see the water here is really reflective. It's reflecting all the lights. I have all these weird cyberpunk buildings. And there's bars and restaurants and AI all mill around here. Um... <clears throat> more performant eye, oh, okay yeah, so like I said C Sharp is really good and it performs faster than Java, JavaScript, Python maybe not faster than C++ but when you're coding in C Sharp it actually gets converted into C++ in the background so it does run very fast uh, and it's very similar to Java like I said 
and C sharp is not easy. Sometimes I make out that it's easy, but it's still not easy. It's still a fully fledged coding language that takes a lot of um, time and effort to get into. And you should look at basic tutorials on YouTube. I mean, you need to know what things like ints, floats, booleans are, um, for loops, if loops, just the very basics of uh, general coding. And I did do some videos on on this stuff, which uh, JB could share, but unfortunately they're in Java, but um, almost identical to C, C Sharp, but there's a lot of C Sharp ones out there anyway. <coughs> right, so the ball we put in without code. Now we want it to appear from code, right? So, for example, if you wanted 100 balls, you know, and I have to duplicate it 100 times and position them all and, and make them fall, you want some code to be able to make an instance of the ball anytime it wants so it could make 10 million for you without any you know clicking and that or dragging so for that we need a script um, a C sharp script and then we need to open it initialize things and then write some code in the update method which is called every single frame like 50 well, six, let's just say 60 times a second, right? That's how you get your 60 frames per second video games is because there's a loop that constantly executes over and over and over and over again to move everything just slightly on every frame. And that's how it kind of produces the illusion of animation. So I usually think of the update or the game loop as, as a bit like a dog that's chasing its tail and it, and it never stops, it just keeps going round and round and round and round and round and that's how all, all games work uh, so how do we do the ball so we need to make it reusable so meaning that you can create an instance of the ball a duplicate, a clone of it over and over and over again, to do that you make it a prefab which is kind of like a file on the disk that you can read that will make a copy of the ball from it. So we'll do that now, right? So when you make a prefab, you should name it something sensible. Well, I haven't named these sensible, have I? So uh, I'll name these first. Call that left ramp. There's no caps lock light on this keyboard, which is annoying. Right ramp and let's call it what did I say Ravensbourne football I'll put a, a X on the end of mine because I think I've already got a prefab like that so let's just find you, you should make a directory here that makes sense to you this is a total mess actually um, but where I keep mine is in a, fo a folder called RSL content here so if you just drag it into one of your folders like this from the hierarchy into the project window this is I should have explained that project window a bit better that is what holds all of your um, can I'm trying to move the window down but I've got too much stuff in the way anyway this one here is the project window the one showing all of your files so when I drag that in it made a file here called Ravensbourne Football with a little blue cube. That means it's a prefab. And you can see in the hierarchy it actually changed from being like a non-colored cube to a blue cube. That tells you that it's actually a prefab. So now we've made it a prefab in there. We don't need the that instance of it that we made. So we can delete that. And we want to write a script to um, instance that football on its own without the mouse click. So if you right click create C sharp script we'll call it Ravens born footy demo press enter what that does is generate the script and some uh, actual methods for you like bits of code so if I double click it open it up here in Rider or Visual Studio it doesn't matter you'll see it's actually made uh, everything I need um, game, uh, make a new game object, call it game object. Uh, yeah, 
Oh, rumors.demo.cs, that's what I was meant to call it. Um, so I'll look at the um, code that I prepared before, which is right here. So you don't need to do anything in start at the moment, but you do need to be able to make the football, um, you need to reference the football somehow, right? So if you just go to the top here, and you paste it here. Now, I'm not sure uh, if everyone knows about public, private, and all of that, but um, public meaning it's accessible outside of the script. But in Unity's case, if I save that and go back, what public means is even better than that. It actually gives you, wait for it to compile a second. It actually gives you like a slot that you can drag the football into. But what I will do is, well, I've got to be able to move this Unity window. Oh, there it is. Okay, so what I should have said is Unity uses lots of individual scripts. It's not just one big script. So you, often you can make an, an object just called game logic, and you can add the scripts to that, right? So we'll add the one we just made, Ravenspawn footy demo, drag it onto there like that. So now we've added the script, and you can see there's a slot here for the football. That happened because we put public game object football, allowing any game object to be dragged in there, even a prefab, like the one we just made. So we drag the prefab in, right, because it is a game object. Pretty much everything in Unity is a game object. And you can see now it's been assigned. <coughs> and football, the variable football is initialized with the Ravenspawn football. And if some of this is confusing, probably you should go back, have a look at some C-sharp uh, basics and things like that. But yeah, I mean, it, it's confusing at the beginning. I mean, even I'm actually looking at the code that I've <laughs> already written just to make sure I get it all right. But I mean, I write this stuff every day. It's just... I just don't want to waste everyone's time with compiler errors. Um, yeah, so we've done that. We've made the prefab. We've made the game object with the game logic script on it. And we've added the script to it. Now, uh, we've looked at that one, have we? Yeah. That's my main character. I think we had one before, but without the character. There's me pimping Rider out, but I think you can get educational lessons for uh, licenses for Rider, so it's worth asking about. It's much better than Visual Studio because of code completion and things like that are better. It just doesn't wreck things. Yeah. I'll uh, talk to uh, the uh, department leader about this because that would actually be really good to get the students an academic license access to Rider. So I'm on, I'm on it. it. Yeah, it would. I mean, I was looking to buy it, but when I bought it, I was like, wow, so much better. So how do you instance an object? Well, always check the Unity docs and uh, Google and Stack Overflow constantly for answers because well, there's really no point in trying to remember everything. You can actually uh, get to the Unity documents here, docs.unity.3d.com, and it'll tell you... Um, what you need to know, as you can see here, what we need is instantiate, and that takes a prefab like the one we made, and a position which is in vector three, which sounds confusing, but it's not really. That's actually the x, y, and z positioning in the three D world, and this thing after quaternions, they're like you know Einstein level of mathematics I can't really get my head around them so you just put what they tell you to do but um, you don't always need uh, quaternions the way I did it is with yeah so the way I've already I messed around with is instantiate the football which is our prefab at transform dot position well that means at the position of this game object that the script is attached to so 
it'll actually make it at wherever game game logic is and you can see here on the top right where it is and that's kind of just you know random so if you go uh, reset get that back to zero and then uh, just pull this out a little bit you can also you can double click to zoom in on things you don't have to uh, press F so you can see that it's um, not quite in the right place we want it to where the ball should drop so if you zoom out and look like that and you think well I'll probably pull it into the middle like that press F to make sure that there's no optical illusions going on because sometimes you think you've got it in the right place and you're, you're miles off that looks good pull it up press F again so you can imagine if something dropped from here it'll be alright so the script will use the position of the game object it's attached to so the position is 0 on X, 26 on Y, 42.9 on Z and it will also use the rotation as you can see here so transform just means uh, it's a tough one to explain actually the transform is really just the uh, position and rotation of the object so when this when we instance our football it will appear at the same position and rotation as the script as the object that the script is attached on i.e. it will appear here so uh, we'll copy that we'll copy this whole thing and I'll explain it um, so because update is checking constantly over and over again if you put that if input dot get button down right that, that actually calls upon the unity library to check if the buttons down and fire one is left mouse button really um, so it'll, it'll go is the left mouse button down is the left mouse button down um, and then if it is what we will do is we'll make just a standard object we'll just call it clone which will be a copy of our football at the position and rotation of the object that this script is on and uh, destroy just destroys it in 10 seconds just so we don't get millions of footballs um, queuing up because uh, even uh, the computer even a top computer will slow down if you if you don't destroy it I know I said before you don't have to worry about memory but this isn't memory this is actual a game object in the game world you still have to destroy them so if we run that what should happen is I'll just save it and compile it I should be able to press left mouse button fire one that should make a football at the right position and because we know it's got gravity already and the bounce physics it should drop and bounce and then disappear in 10 seconds so let's have a look at that yes yes bundles obviously nothing's happened because I haven't clicked the left mouse button yet so left whoa there it is and I can create loads which is awesome and they all bounce off each other and you can go crazy see how unity handles it I mean you can still produce a lot of footballs if you uh, would have multi thread these with there's a new system called dots which I won't go into because I'm still struggling to understand it myself but if each of these was properly on a thread controlled by dots you could probably make 10 million before there'd be any problem and you can see that they're all working in real time reflections and everything and you can see them dropping like that and then they will disappear that's the destroy kicking in after the 10 seconds So yeah, like I was saying, uh, what? Missile. Oh yeah, I, I must have copied this from the uh, documents that they, their documents, missile should be there somewhere. Oh yeah, that's missile right there. So their example was shooting uh, a missile, right? Instantiating it at the right, we'll probably, let's assume that the script is added to a spacecraft and it's uh, or a gun 
and it's appearing at the position and rotation of the object that the script is added on. And then they've got timeout, destruct F5, but that's not actually a real piece of code. That's just an example if they'd written a system that does that. Um, so yeah, as, as explained, that instance is the, the projectile the right place in rotation. And I've gone over that a few times because I think it's quite a difficult one to get your head around at the beginning. And um, if you've done a bit of coding, you'll know that these slashes here are just comments. So you can type anything in there to remind yourself what the code is doing. And unless it's obvious, you should do it. Because later, when you come back, you, you'll not remember what's happening. But don't do it if it's obvious. Don't If it says, like, you know, if ball position is greater than width of screen, don't put, don't make a comment like, oh, if the ball is out of the width of the screen, because the code speaks for itself a lot of the time, especially if you write it properly. I mean, if you were to call uh, this missile, um, I don't know, tree or something, and that projectile, you know, sausage, then that would be very confusing because you'd be like, why is there a tree there, instant, instant a sausage? You know, you should keep it meaningful, correct, and sensible. And actually, I used to have fun making really, really silly names. Um, and I learned that the hard way. And I've got a game that I wrote once that <laughs> you could look at one day where everything was so, so silly. The names that it literally took me about six months longer to work out what the hell was going on. <coughs> but you do that when you're young and you don't really realize the point of <laughs> naming things properly. Right. We've talked about how the mouse has been pressed and how it will instance the footballs. And I've already done that, copy the whole if statement. This would be easier if I was flicking between two screens, but I want to keep it on one, that's why I'm doing stuff that, uh, reading stuff that I've already done. Uh, so we tweak it to our needs by adding that code we've just done, which is here. Yep. Yeah. So one thing I wanted to point out, and I don't think it's actually working in my. Is it working in Rider right now? I have a project that is so complicated, even Rider fails sometimes. But it is, yes. Let's say we tried to do the instancing without the. Uh, without declaring it up here, you'd see the football becomes red and it cannot resolve it because it hasn't been declared so you declare it by making sure it's there and then if you're familiar with normal programming you initialize it um, by dragging it into the inspector in Unity and then you can make an instance of it here but actually you, you, in you initialize it by dragging it into the inspector this just makes a copy of it uh, it becomes easier once you mess around with it Right, just said that, yeah. Save return, uh, script to Unity. Uh, yep. I've gone a lot quicker than I thought I would, actually. Um, That's absolutely fine, guys. Seriously, you don't need to. That's absolutely fine. That's definitely Cool. So, yeah, one thing I wanted to point out is the. Um, when I make a new football here. You can see on the hierarchy here, they're being made in there as separate game objects, and they're called clones. And when you click on each of them, they actually look identical, apart from their positions. As you can see, they're falling and moving, and then they get destroyed. And you can close these up. Uh, one other nifty trick is if you want, you can use this little lock in the corner which means, see, when you click on things here, they always appear in the inspector on the right, which you might not always want. So if you click on the lock there, whatever you click on doesn't affect it. You can see it's still on the main camera there because of the lock, which comes in very handy when you're trying to drag and drop things, and the inspector keeps showing different things. Uh, I mentioned that about, you know, enough footballs will wreck the game. And this is just an overhead shot of my uh, city, 
just to show the complexity and these are different districts and there's layers below the sky rises you can actually get on top of all of these buildings everything you see is real and you can get to it um, so if you spend enough time you can make your, an entire city you could make a Grand Theft Auto type game um, all on your own or you can get you and all your mates together or you and your, your classmates and work on something like that and you can buy buildings and models and things from <coughs> from the asset store to uh, you know build your world so yeah this was an extra exercise I thought about which I might just show now or maybe I should leave it um, as something for you guys to do but it's it's not a, a huge thing but it's basically just adjusting the code to make the ball appear on its own without a mouse click right so you, you still need the instantiate line it's exactly the same it makes a ball um, but you want to make it every few seconds so you can track time passed in you in unity using time dot delta time delta meaning you know change of time time over change change over time yeah change over time um, and that tells you in seconds how long it's passed in by returning a float which is like you know one with a decimal place like 9.6 or 9.7 rather than 1 2 3 which are integers whole numbers so you need to store how much time has actually passed by adding delta time to it so um, yeah you declare that you need a float we'll call it time passed we'll stick that up here private float time passed and then you put that in update and you can use uh, time passed equals time passed plus uh, time dot delta time so time passed equals time passed plus delta time is because you want to keep the original value of time passed and add whatever's changed a more succinct way to do it would be time passed plus equal to time dot delta but that's the exact same as writing time passed equals time passed plus time dot delta but uh, plus equal to maybe you guys don't know yet or maybe you do you can choose uh, what to do but we'll put it back to the most simple one right now so every update time passed will increment a little bit with whatever the change of time has been and then you can actually check if it's past a second so you can see if time passed is greater than one and then um, you can whoa you can print out a message this keyboard's not good um, one second has passed but of course once one second's passed it'll keep going up and up so we'll just say time now is time passed and you can actually print out the, the value of time passed there by adding it to the string value that you passed to debug.log so we'll run that and see what happens now one of the most important things is the console window which is jammed up here at the moment I'm going to move it just as soon as Unity compiles so if you go to uh, window general console then you get this window here which is just like a debug output window like a console window like you get logcat in Android Studio and everything has this window that prints things out it's exceedingly useful so a quick couple of tricks about that you can clear it obviously you can collapse it so if it says exactly the same thing which it won't here because of the, the way the time's going up it'll it'll not keep duplicating that you can have it pause when it hits an error <coughs> yeah that just tells you what it can log and you can turn on and off comments like that I mean yeah, debug logs so you can hide them there they are and you can put warnings on and errors on by clicking each of these so as you can see the time has got up to 
53 and it's just carrying on going. So we, we actually want to like isolate one second, right? So it's, it's easy, you can just say time passed equals zero. So every time time passed gets past one, one second, goes back to zero, and then at the beginning of the loop, uh, we'll start again. So it should only now print, just delete this, when one second has passed, and it'll keep resetting it. And, you, and one good thing, as long as you don't have a complex game going, you can actually change the code during runtime. You see the game's still playing. I edited the code and saved it, and, the, and you'll see here that the behavior actually works. You don't have to restart the game. So now you can see one second has passed, one second has passed, one second has passed. So all, all we want to do now actually is instance a ball every second. Um, so it's quite simple actually. You can just take the code from there that we already did and put it in there and you can get rid of that as well. Um, and if you save that and then go back to Unity, what should happen is a ball should start getting made every one second without us clicking on it. So let's have a look. Come on, ball, you can do it. There we go. You can see that, and you can click on any of the balls to... Uh, let me just... One good thing is the way you can move everything around in Unity so you can actually hide that console window over there. It's like a tab. And if I uh, double click on any of them or, or click them and then click F, it'll follow it. And if you actually focus on it and then hold Shift F, it'll follow it automatically without you having to do anything. Let me just do that. Disappearing. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, you can see it's following. Well, it's kind of. It's because they're dying so quick. Basically, it'll follow it. See how the camera's moving on its own there. Um, it must be too close to the camera. Yeah. So, we've done that. We've done the time passed. Um, well that was going to be an extra bit of work but uh, we've just done it so uh, we don't need to do that now um, keep producing fo footballs yeah, there's a few other ideas you can, you can tweak the ramps you could make some sort of pinball game you could write some code that actually makes flippers move and hit the ball and you could change the ball size um, you could actually do that in real time let me bring back the uh, project window I think because this is a prefab then we can uh, we can actually change it in real time so let's say I make the ball uh, the sphere bigger just change the radius Unity will save the prefab and then the next ones generated will be the new one which has sent them flying up in the air for some reason Strange, but yeah, you could change. Um, I see it's because they're they're actually instancing inside them each other because I'm in the same place. So maybe if we leave, we leave a delay of uh, let's see five seconds to give the ball time to get out of the um, place where the next ball appears, then you'll see then you can do little changes, you could change the bounce material to something else um, you could uncheck gravity which would just make it float in midair um, is, kin is kinematic is, it, is when you want the rigid body to be there but not necessarily do anything so if I tick is kinematic the ball should spawn but not do anything you see it's just not using gravity, so you can actually untick that. There is a time and a place for that. 
so if I um, just do that again make them a bit bigger just so you can see that ball, what's that one doing? going up but yeah you could change this uh, into like a physics game you could add a script to that and that so it hits the ball like I say pinball um, yeah you could get models of the assets though you could you could download a, a jungle and have rocks falling into the jungle instead or make a make, download a pool put some water in it and have uh, beach balls going into it you can spend all day doing that it's really fun ah uh, yes so the other thing you could do um, is try and build it out which is awesome when it works that is if you have a really complex project it can be difficult but if you go to file build settings and you add open scenes so you add your own one strange is it already in oh it's because I haven't saved the scene that's why if you'd save the scene and you click add open scenes there then it will appear in this list and you can just tick one the one you want to build and uh, I'm not going to click on a different platform here because it'll re-import the whole game it's one thing to remember it will re-import your whole game to make it compatible with this and in my case that takes about five days <laughs> so I've got PC, Mac and Linux on at the moment but you can use uh, UWP I think that's that weird Windows format that you can buy off the Windows store that no one uses TV, OS <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Oh God! Gotta, well, yeah, I was sort of slagged Apple before I slagged uh, the Windows Store. But has anyone actually used that? I think I've looked at it once. Yeah, <laughs> right, uh, yeah. I mean, it, 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 it is good because don't forget, this is. I mean, bear in mind, dude, we're having conversations about your game coming to Xbox. So, yeah, that is going to be that. Oh yeah, it is actually. That's what it compiles to, isn't it? Yeah, same thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you, when you build using um, UWP, you can one button push export to anything in Microsoft environment, be it an Xbox, a PC, one of their new split screen surface phones, anything. Oh, you know what? I love Windows Universal Platform. <laughs> 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 it's going to save my life. <laughs> so you've got PS4, iOS, don't know why anyone would use that. No, I'm just joking. PS5, <laughs> Xbox, Android, WebGL, and if you've got the developer kits, you can get the Nintendo one and things like that. So you could try building this to your Android, and it'll produce an APK you can run on your device. iOS will produce the IPA file, but you do need to do that on a Macintosh, and you do need Xcode, and it gets quite nightmarish at times. But if you've got a Mac and you know what you're doing, that's fine. It should work. Um... I don't use the Mac much. WebGL is interesting because it will generate the WebGL code, which is HTML5 and JavaScript. It'll automatically convert the entire game into that, and then you can upload it to your website, send the link to your friends. You can even put it on itch.io as a game. I've got a few up there on my itch page. Um, and an interesting thing is that Unity just emailed me today with a game jam, which you can find if you just Google create with code game jam and it's all about making portfolio pieces and you know putting them out on webgl or whatever and getting them on your website so if you have a look at that uh it's, it's this one um and it's well it's an hour and a half hour and 50 minute jam that's not a lot of time is it oh it's i think it lasts a couple of days yeah no yeah, it mustn't do Anyway, if you're really interested, you could do that. There's some other videos here that'll uh, give you tips and stuff. Um, yeah, it's uploaded to itch. Put a lot of time into Unity if you really want to uh, get good at it. If you really want to make 3D games and you're really passionate. Um, if you're not and you prefer databases and things like that, that's fine. Um, read the documents, you know, it sounds sad, but you know, you could even read them in the tablet, in bed, <laughs> before you go to sleep. Um, make a physics game, like I was saying, what about firing a ball at a tower of blocks that knocks them down for points, a bit like Angry Birds, um, and then get them on itch. 
just have a lot of fun with Unity basically until you learn it. And it, it could take uh, you know a couple of years to feel like you're a pro with Unity, but once you get to that point, you'll feel really powerful. And one day you could be working on Call of Duty or Assassin's Creed, or you could make your own big game. You could make your own Minecraft. That was all made by one guy using Java, in fact. Um, and you could make Minecraft infinitely easier using Unity than what he did. You could you could probably make a Minecraft clone in Unity, and I mean a basic one in a couple of months, really. Um, so yeah, I think that's it, actually. Um, if there's any questions or anything like that, it'd be good to hear them. Or maybe I can do another demonstration of something if someone's interested. Okay, so guys, um, just a couple of things. So I would first of all like to uh, thank Gas for his amazing presentation. Um, if you've got questions, keep it, let's keep it for 10 minutes slot because something I should have said is today is actually Gaz's birthday today. Yeah. And he's still come out and helped us and done this presentation on his birthday. So, so will everybody join, join me and say happy birthday. Happy birthday, Gaz. Happy birthday. 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 Happy I came out here for love, but I also worked on one of the biggest apps in, in the whole country, which is called Pic Collage, which I wrote in Android, which you probably use or have seen. My mates in the UK are all using Pic Collage, so that's actually a Taiwanese product that I created. That's all I want to see. How many downloads? No, it's 60 million downloads. Jesus. It's in the top ten apps in the entire world. Boom. Of course, I didn't. I, I didn't get rich. <laughs> yes, Fox Messenger. <laughs> okay, Yeah, I've watched a few actually where you mention it. <laughs> um, right. Okay. Has anybody got any questions for Gaz before we wrap up? Um, I was going to say, how did you make those buildings like, but well, I mean, I guess that would be for another time, because there's people who are going to explain No, no, not at all. Um, first of all, you could make a cube and wrap a picture on it that looks like a building, or you could make it in something really basic, like SketchUp. Um, SketchUp, Google SketchUp is a great tool for making basic things. Um, or you could use Blender, which is a lot more complicated, or ZBrush. But actually, I just bought them off the asset store. You just go to the asset store, find what you want, buy the buildings, and then tweak them, make them look a bit different so that people can't cry that you're you're flipping assets or whatever, you know. You just change it up a bit and put them the way you want. But really, a lot of the stuff you see in that game is, is paid for, and then I've just painstakingly put metal textures and pipes and things like that on it. So basically, the asset store is your, is your answer for anything you want, really. Or if you've got... 3D model friends, you could write code for them, they could make models for you. That's how me and JB met, actually, I think. Yeah, yeah that is. Remember the first, remember um, Dead Walk? Yeah, the zombie yeah. game. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, that, that, I, you know, we still need to get, dude. I've been doing more small prototyping on that. I seriously think we need to do that game as a 3D side scroller. I really do. Yeah, well, that was the game I mentioned right at the beginning of the video that I dropped all the tools for. I wrote Dead Plus Plus, which is basically Unity for 2D games, and I thought it was amazing, and I was making the Dead Walk, the zombie game, in it. As soon as I saw Unity, I was like, oh, Christ, I just wasted eight years of my life. What's the point? Just get Unity oh, and then start something new. Me you here every day. Remember <laughs> yeah, well... Oh it was uh, that was the problem with Unity. I picked it up, and as a proper proper coder who doesn't really use any drag and drop, I thought this is not for me. This is too complicated. All these weird buttons, and I don't know what it's all about. But as soon as I got that ball bouncing like that, or something like that similar, I thought, wow, that's just saved me years of work. So you know, Unity is is amazing. Of course, Unreal is good too, and they have some top end AAA tech which. I really like the look of, but I just haven't learned it, so I, I can't give um, much on it. But you can 
you can code in both Unity and Unreal without code. You can use Playmaker on Unity to drag and drop and make code that way, which is good if you really hate code. And you can do the same in Unreal using blueprints. How do you use play? How do you click on? How do you find play mode on Unity? Because I've never even heard that. This is the first time. I think uh, Playmaker is. It's an asset on the store, right? And I, I think they, they either bought it or they gave it away free at some point. I do have it. So you go to the asset store and you just look for Playmate, uh, Playmaker. Um, and there's also, like, if you go to, like, Asset Management here, I know, Package Manager, Unity have started moving all their tools into here. And you can get so many cool things that are free from Unity just by looking at this. Um, course there is a few network issues in my house I don't know why it struggles to get them sometimes but you can either get it from the package manager or the asset store and uh, start dragging and dropping and making code um, which is awesome because you know you don't have to write all the curly brackets and stuff but eventually when your screen is full of boxes with arrows pointing and things you start to wonder whether it's actually simpler, simpler than coding itself or it's just as confusing really but worth a try Thank you. It's alright. Any more questions? Okay, okay. I think you've actually managed, actually managed to, to overload and stun them in silence, man. <laughs> yeah, that was a lot. There is a lot there, but I thought rather than go too easy, you might as well give some way of making something cool straight away and even. You could probably follow this through and have something on itch within two hours, which is a miracle when you think about how good the tech is to do that. Okay, okay um, guys, if you've got nothing else, else um, you, guys you guys are done for the day. You've got lots to ruminate over. over. We'll, we'll say thank, thank you to Gaz for sparing his time for us. For and, us. and, and um, yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll be uploading the, the video and the decks to this between today and tomorrow. And tomorrow. Right. Thank, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to open up some beer now. 41 a day. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much, Jazz. And uh, thanks, guys, for participating and joining in. Cheers, guys. Good luck with Unity.